Good afternoon, ladies. It's absolutely wonderful to have you again today for the uh, fourth lecture in the ceramic series. And today my guest is uh, Grace Han. Grace is based in um, Vancouver. I'm going to put the spotlight on her so we can all see her. And um, Grace actually was brought to my attention by Crafted Vancouver. Marion, who works with Carrie at Crafted Vancouver, said you have absolutely to have Grace on your program because she's one of the Canadian rising stars. So I'm delighted to welcome you today, Grace. Thank you so very much. You're in Vancouver and um, this is a background that is ab absolutely gorgeous. We'll talk about what it represents. It's not quite your studio yet. <laughs> <laughs> yet. <laughs> and um, I'd like to start with your story, which is an unusual uh, story and a, a, a very profound uh, story. You grew up in South Korea. Hmm? and you decided to study ceramic. That's where the story starts. Right. So you finish, you finish your degree and um, you join one of the big ceramic brands in South Korea. Mm -hmm. Take us from there. What happens then? So first of all, in Korea, I had to choose major before I applied for the school. Oh, hang on, you are mute. Sorry. Can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So when I applied for the school, I had to choose a major even before touching clay. So I got into the four-year intense ceramic program, and then of course I got in love. So after that, I applied for that position at a ceramic company and then I got into the company and then I enjoyed working there but I didn't see myself being an artist. I, I loved working with clay and then working as a PR manager for the company. Yeah but I didn't see myself making things in a studio as a full-time artist. Yeah so I worked there for a few years then I quit the job because I feel like I don't know, I went to school that I wanted to go to and then I got a job where I wanted to work. So I wanted to challenge myself. So I went to New Zealand with zero English <laughs> and I struggled there. Then I came back to Korea and then I met my partner. He's from Winnipeg, so he's Canadian. So I met him in Korea and then I ended up in, in Canada. Okay, so let's, um, before we get to Canada, what happened in New Zealand? What were you doing in New Zealand? How long were you there for? I was there for eight months. I was just traveling. Yes, yeah, so I rented a car and then just traveling around the island. I went to language school. So I was able to say something to my homestay parents. Yeah, it was good. So, I mean, all by yourself? Yes. That's that takes a lot of courage. You were how old were you then? You were what early? 20s? I was I was twenty five. So okay. the, I saved money from the job, right? The ceramic company. So all the money that I saved it just went into that trip. Right, that's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you came back with a little bit of English and um, and somehow met this handsome Canadian <laughs> <laughs> who, then, who then proceeded to pluck you out of your environment and drop you in Winnipeg. So Winnipeg is, uh, is it's a complicated city for anybody because just mm -hmm. by the weather. So you mm -hmm. arrived there and then how did you settle there? So I, unfortunately, I arrived in Winnipeg in January. <laughs> So I remember one night I was having dinner with my partner and then I was crying. Like, I don't think I can do this. I have to be out of here, it's super cold. But he was saying that, Grace, we are having a mild winter this year. Like it was like crazy. So I stayed like, so I lived in Winnipeg in total nine years until I moved to BC. But the first two years, again, I wasn't thinking of being an artist. 
I think as a newcomer, I thought I can't be the person I want to be. So I was being really humble. I was making myself so small. So I was just working at a coffee shop. Then I was thinking, oh, if I can just make pots here and there as a hobbyer, that would be perfect for my life. But then of course I wasn't happy and then the harsh weather and I felt so isolated, no friends, no family. So this ceramic and the things that I love, it was kind of calling me for a couple of years. So I was just searching like ceramic programs in Canada, but I have BFA, so maybe I can get masters. So masters in Canada, but I was, I was not brave enough to be out of Winnipeg by myself, although I went to New Zealand. <laughs> so I chose University of Manitoba because that's where I was. And then they had that MFA program. So I got into the program and it was 2014. And then, yeah, my journey started from there. So you arrived in, I mean, at the school uh, thinking that you know, you knew what it was to be a ceramicist, and I mean, you could, you could do ceramic. You could, you could throw. Mm -hmm. You could, you could do all that. But you could do it the Korean way. Mm -hmm. um, so, can you explain to us a little bit how, what is the aesthetic and what is the philosophy of making ceramic in uh, in South Korea? Oh. Uh... I can just explain my education and my experience. Because the school I went to in Korea, they are well known for, <clears throat> excuse me, their endeavor to preserve the Korean traditional ceramics. So like, for example, when I, when I teach my students here in Canada, the, for beginners, I ask them to make like cylinders so that's the kind of way to build their basic throwing skills. But in Korea, how I was taught is, many of you might know the, I don't know, we call it sabal in Korean or dawan, but many people call it chawan because it's Japanese. So my very first wheel throwing class, we had to make those bowls, like traditional bowls. And yeah, we had, and another class like for hand building or like in any ways to build our skills, we had to mimic the Korean traditional ceramics. So it wasn't just like hand building, like what do you wanna make? And then let's learn the skill. It wasn't like that. I remember one instructor showed me the slideshows. So basically it's like a history kind of lecture. So this piece is made in this, this date and the techniques are involved and blah, blah, blah. So we had like a few options and we had to pick one piece from the slideshow and they made the same piece. Then by doing that, we were learning how to carve or how to inlay and those things. And another example is that I went back to Korea between my MFAs and stayed at my professor's studio for a month. I wanted to gain like a specific techniques but again, I had to throw those tea balls that I had to make at the beginning of my BFA program for three weeks every day, all day to make the perfect tea balls. So it had to feel right in hand. It's not just about like making the shape, but you have to feel right in his hands and then in my hand as well. So it was very intense. So there was the education, like my professors and my colleagues and even myself because of the education, like we really appreciate those traditional techniques and ceramics. And then that's how I was introduced to ceramics. So it's really like deeply embedded in my work as well. Like I can't let like go. <laughs> right, so it's really learning by copying and by getting the technique absolutely 100% perfect and mm -hmm. you just do it it's really the uh, the epitome of the 10,000 hour principle that you have to do the same thing for 10,000 hour until you really can call yourself an expert so how did you um, negotiate that tradition with the way of doing ceramic in Canada so um, I just be honest <laughs> of course. first year was uh, like full of struggles and of course like I was just making what I used to make, but like 
A, people were not understanding what I was making, and then B, they were not interested. So they wanted to see my work, like the work that can show Grace Han, but what I was making is basically Korean traditional ceramics. So I was encouraged to be more conceptual. And I was really confused. What does that mean? Like being conceptual, being contemporary, what does that mean? I couldn't fully understand. Because although like I'm using the traditional techniques and then I'm making those parts that represents Korea, but I'm making it, I, I, I'm alive, isn't it contemporary? Like I was really confused. And another challenge was that I had to explain what I was making. Like in Korea, I make those tea bowls and then everyone knew, oh, you made a sabal or I make a fermenting jar and then everyone knows, oh, that's ongi. But I had to keep explaining like, oh, Chris, what's that? I love the form. Oh, this is, you know, the ongi that's fermenting vessels. And I was very, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say I was getting tired, but I feel like, why do I have to keep explaining what I'm making in a way that, so that, I, and I feel like I was responsible to represent Korean traditional ceramics. So the first year went by like that, like kept explaining and then keep encouraged, challenged. But then after first year, there was like a moment where I realized that I, what I have been making isn't about me. And why do I feel so pressured to represent this Korean traditional ceramics? Of course, whenever I go back to Korea, even now, and I, I, I meet up with my professors, they keep saying that, okay, you have to educate the next generations because Korean, especially ceramics, some people or many people still think that, you know, our, we are kind of lost. We lost the ceramic culture and then many people think about or talk about Chinese and Japanese ceramics. So yeah, my professors felt really responsible and that that was passed on to me. And then they were telling me it's now my turn to do that. But in school after first year, I was struggling a lot, not just with between the Korean and Canadian ceramics, but also as a newcomer and then no family, no friends. So I wanted to just make something that I want I can show who I am, Grace Han, not the Korean traditional ceramics. Yeah, so the second year I started, I tried to be not completely, but a bit free from that responsibility. And then, yeah, start thinking about what do I want? Who am I? What I want to make? And if I make something, okay, where do I see myself in the piece? Yeah, so they started from my second year. Mm. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, it's not a tradition, uh, uh, whether you're a ceramicist or not, but in general in Korea, to talk about yourself. Um, you know, we, you, you just, one doesn't talk about oneself or share emotions so openly and, and express oneself. So you had a double um, hurdle to go over the, the, the cultural and then the the traditional ceramic way. Um, so you you decided to express yourself, and how did you go about it? What was the the way you uh, you chose to do that? So I didn't know, and then I was studying myself, what I do, what I want to make. But then I found a pattern that when I'm stressed or when I'm when I feel isolated or sad or so basically, whenever I have this negative emotion, I found myself making large piece in a more traditional way that doesn't involve any electric power. So that means it needs my body power, body strength. So that was my way to go through those struggles. Okay, so I'm going to share a few photos here showing exactly that um, um, what you are talking about. Um, here we see you um, throwing these gigantic pots. I mean, um, I think the one on the left must be just as tall as you are, no? <laughs> <laughs> um, and doing that work 
with the uh, non-electric uh, mm -hmm. wheel. So your, your process um, is all about working the, the clay with the body. That's how you decided to go about it. Tell us a little bit more about it. So I wanted to put myself in each piece. So for particularly in these big pieces, I usually go through this process when I have something to process here. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes it's really like, it requires tremendous body power. So I eat a lot, then I go there, then so if I can talk about process a little bit, I make right. long slab. So I make like block of clay and then I stretch it by throwing it on the floor. So I make a really long slab and then I build it, the layers, and then I pedal and then I throw. But when it comes to throwing, it's dry throwing. So I use re really like a minimum amount of water so that in order to build that large vessel, it takes about two and a half to three hours, not three days. So to finish that within that hour, like I don't use water. So it's traditional technique. So it adds more physicality into the process. And then I use the kick wheel. So I have to like, I just sweat like crazy. And then I sometimes, so whenever I see those big parts, I can see myself at the moment of making. Then yeah, yeah, that piece, like I was crying on the floor because I was really emotional or yeah, I did something. I made that in that studio. Like I can recall those times. So when so you the- really, Yeah, you really have a, a, um, a, almost a wrestling with the material because um, the fact that it is uh, quite dry makes it extremely challenging physically to throw and then to build it. It's much easier when there's lots of water. It, it slides, mm -hmm. it glides, it does whatever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, where when you are uh, in, in almost a dry material, it's very heavy because of the, um, uh, the size of it. And then once you've built it, you also slap it uh, with your paddle, is that right? And you slap okay. the inside, the outside, you, um, it's really three hours of, of a wrestling game. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said that you see yourself in the pot, but is it, is it the, the pot is a representation or is it the process that the representation of, of your emotion at that moment? I think maybe both. What I'm trying to do in the process is that people don't see as, as not like, once it's finished and then glazed fired, all people are gonna see is the large pot or beautiful vessels. And many people say that, but what I really wanna do, what I wanna, what I'm trying to do is that I want to make like authentic pieces. That's something that, you know, so basically not pretentious parts. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, that represents really who you are. And mm -hmm. so I want for me, like in the process, being myself, being raw, being authentic, that's really critical. Mm -hmm. So one day I made something. I think it was for some project. Somebody asked me to make something, then I made it. And then I just, yeah, pushed over right away because it wasn't me. It was kind of pretend, yeah, pretentious. So. Right. Yeah, for me, like me communicating in the process, communicating with myself or with materials and then going through all the emotional process is really important. And then that represents in the pot. I can see that. Right. I mean, we're very lucky because the end result is absolutely glorious. We're looking at it right now. Um, how tall is this pot? It's about, I don't know, I, I use centimeters. So it's yeah. about like... 70 centimeters. Oh, okay. All right. So, um, so almost three feet, um, which is, it is very tall. It's probably, um, what well, it's more than half your size, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, so you had that, that whole period where you were very bold and you needed to learn to let go of yourself, but then you came back to your tradition in a way, and you call that period, 
the quiet grace after the first period was the bold grace, the loud grace. Now we are in the quiet grace and we can recognize, uh, you know, I think your, uh, your Korean um, uh, background and culture, even though it's um, more contemporary, I think that teapot on the right is absolutely delightful. So during that period, what happens when you do these quiet pieces? Is it a different process, a different um, frame of mind? So I make those big pots and then make these pieces the same period. So the, of course, I'm not like sad all the time, right? And then I don't need the body engagement all the time. So the big pieces, I go through that when I need that. But in these pieces, the small pieces, it's also... The process is really important. So for, for example, these teapots, these are like, I made plaster molds and then I cast it. So it's a repetitive process. So whenever I cast these, for example, teapots, I make like dozens of bodies, dozens of lids and handles. And then I sit down at a desk, a table, and then I assemble. They could take hours and hours. So my hands are really busy. And then people would know that plate dries out right so you have to find the right timing to attach pieces so my hands are busy my eyes are busy but I can process some thoughts in my head so yeah I just get different parts or yeah just process different thoughts in the yeah when I make these pieces it's more of a, of a meditative quiet um, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like we were talking a couple of weeks ago to uh, Silver Smith, um, uh, Michael Lloyd, who was saying that he's so absorbed in some part of his work that he forgets about the body and about the environment and he is the piece, he is in there. It's a little bit the same thing for you when you do these pieces, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, here is another quiet piece, which that's a, a nightstand, a different technique again, I think, mm -hmm. on this. Um, and then again, we are back here a little bit more with the uh, the Korean tradition of the moon jar. Is that mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of the uh, of the idea? And then you decide that you need to do performance work. So I shared the um, the CBC video um, documentary that was done about you, and that shows that process. But maybe you can take us through it a little bit. Tell us. A little bit more about what what that was about. Mm -hmm. So until that point, so why I decided to create that performance video is that, as I just mentioned, the process itself. So basically, people are missing the content, right? So whenever I put out those large pieces for an exhibition or something, the comments that I was getting was, "Wow, that's so beautiful." Oh, that's so beautiful. And then there was it. So it's a good compliment. I appreciate that. But I feel like something is missing. I'm not just trying to create like a beautiful vessel to sell. You know, for me, being authentic, being raw in the process is really important. But people couldn't see that. So and until then, I was very private. I didn't want to talk about my work myself because I was too shy and I felt uncomfortable. But I feel like I have to open up. I have to reveal what I'm doing so that people can also see the contents, what the piece is holding, not just the look. Yeah, so I created that video and then did the performance so that people can see, wow, like that's kind of messy. They could be ugly in the process. People say the beautiful parts, but the behind scene can be ugly. <laughs> Yeah. But the video shows you also shedding your Korean traditional persona and and becoming the contemporary mm -hmm. uh, grace. Uh, that's that was the interesting. And what was um, uh, you shared that video? Did you get different reactions? What did people suddenly said say? Oh, I get it. Or I understand it. Or I you know I'm sorry I didn't realize what you were going through. Was it maybe a cry for help or was it a way to say, look at me, this is who I am? I think I just wanted to 
show who I really am. Like I was, I, I still am quiet. <laughs> I'm a quiet person. So all people see is that, oh, Grace sound from Korea. And some people called me like small Asian lady. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to show like, I was, I felt like I was losing my identity back then. Like I basically, I was going through the identity crisis. So mm -hmm. who I am, am I just small Asian lady? Am I just a newcomer, Grace Han? But I have, I have Korean name, of course. And I have like lots of like boldness inside. And I also have this Korean identity, but I want to be more involved in the Canadian community. So all those mixture, I just wanted to reveal. Like I thought I had to be defined first to show who I am, but that time realized, no, I can't be defined by like one word. Korean grace, Canadian grace, or whatever grace, no. I'll have to live with all this mixture of definition or emotion. So let's just show whatever, whoever I am at the moment. So that video was about that. Um, and then another performance that you did, it's the, uh, the image that we can see behind you and that I'm sharing here. That was a residency that you did in Medicine Hat at Medalta. Mm -hmm. And that was a big moment for you. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't my performance, but that installation, that exhibition involved the audience performance, I would say. So that installation, you can see all the stools and then the white pieces on the floor and the wall. So I invited audience to interact with my pieces directly. So I had to put out a sign actually because people didn't want to touch. Yeah, so I had to put that out, please touch. I just wanted to, so I tried to put my raw self in my pieces, the large pieces, and I wanted to have that direct interaction, direct conversation with people. Yeah, and then I also put those white pieces so that people can move things around. So I just wanted to have the physical conversation. I don't know if it's the right way. <laughs> yeah, so because I'm speaking second language, I sometimes feel I'm very passive, just accept whatever that's happening around me. So sometimes I feel like the authentic conversation is missing. So yeah, myself, I just wanted to put myself and then I invited them to interact with myself, true self, and then see where it's going. So yeah, the wall pieces, people are stacking them and moving them around. They were even making patterns on the wall. And of course people accidentally dropped, which I expected. And then I saw the shards and then there was like a great, I don't know, I don't know, it was, I remember I went back there for closing reception. I didn't have opening reception. So I went there for the last day and then I saw all the shards on the floor and then people interacting with my work. Like I was really emotional, like, mm, I feel like I'm connected with people. That's how I felt. So. I think from now on, I want to go to this direction a little bit more. I want to explore a little bit more how I can invite people to engage with my work. And I mean, um, when you tell people like that to, to touch your art and then to, to, to break it, to move it and all that, do they do it? Do they believe you? Do they do it or do they, are they hesitant? Because um, normally it's don't touch. <laughs> mm. So that's the funny thing, like I said, please touch, right? But people automatically read it as please don't touch. Right. So then we read it, please. But I, I set up the show and then I had to leave. But on the last day when I returned, I asked the staff, the gallery staff, how did it go? Then they said the first two weeks, I think they said it was really challenging because people didn't want to touch. So they had to encourage people, it's okay to touch, it's what the artist wants. And then, you know, we have the sign. So after two weeks, the gallery staff could see some movement and then, you know, and then the momentum was built and then people were really excited to move things around. And then the last day when I was there, one couple was moving things around and then they dropped it by accident. And then I was right behind them. I was talking to somebody else. So they, were, they dropped it and then and they turned around and then I was right behind and I would just gave them two thumbs up. Then 
one kid saw that, that me just saying, okay, it's okay. So he started just breaking it by dropping it on the floor. So he did like four, five, six times in a row straight. Then he was having so much fun. And of course his parents stopped him, of course, but I just had really great moment. You know, like people are not allowed to break pieces. Yeah. It's another way to communicate and, and to express uh, uh, your feeling and, and your um, interaction. I mean, it's a, it's a full body experience as if mm -hmm. you're no longer just a viewer, you're a participant in the art. And that's a very difficult, different uh, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to do more of this? I know that you are at the moment just setting up your new studio because you've, you've only moved to Vancouver a year ago during the pandemic. But hopefully you're going to be able to do more of this. Yes, I would love to invite people to, yeah, engage and interact with my work. That's my goal. Right. Um, you had another big moment recently where you um, you were awarded uh, by Ensika, mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, emerging artist um, award. That is huge. Uh, do you want to share with us a little bit what Ensika is and how do you think it's going to have an impact on your career and on your art? So Ensika, I keep forgetting the International Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts. So they, ha they have like yearly conference every year in March. So there are like, how many, I don't know, there's, large numbers of like lectures, demonstrations. They also have like vendor booth, lots of awards. Every year they select six emerging artists. And then I was chosen, fortunately, uh, this year, one of them. So it was like the, the award itself is huge because it, yeah, it's, it's a recognition. But for me, it was really meaningful it's because I make large pieces. And then I make small pieces and then I use like traditional techniques and also mold make, slip cast. I was told one day by someone that I, I had to pick one style because I do all kinds of things. But Grace, you have to pick one. And I felt like I was thinking like, oh, maybe I should because many people have their own kind of style of work. But he was seeing my work as I don't have any style. But then this award was kind of a formation that I can go to this direction. Then it was recognized by peers. So it, it's like, yeah, it has like, it's meaningful to me. Mm. So um, all this, I mean, it's been a huge progression and um, uh, a growth of your art, of who you are and all that. So Grace right now is still, um, uh, putting herself together <laughs> and she's she's getting more layers and uh, more depth and um, uh, more courage I think um, are you going to you think that you'll carry on teaching and do just your art or um, what projects have you got what, what what emotion are you going to now be sharing uh, through your pieces in the coming year Mm, I'm not sure what emotions I would share. I'll find out when I get there. But what I'm really trying to do is that no makeup grace. So <laughs> I just want to show the real person, like, yeah, just raw self. And then it's really, sometimes I, it makes me feel really anxious. But I feel like in order to communicate with people or in order for people to understand what I'm making, I can't be hiding behind my piece anymore. That's what I realized. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna try to, yeah, just show who I am and then show what I'm making in, a, in an authentic way. And then I really wanna invite people to touch my work. Yeah, just interact with them. That's my, yeah, that's where I'm going, I think. Now, your husband must have been going through the same emotions as you, and he must have been your, um, um, I, I mean, 
the constant or what has been his role in all that? So I make fun of him, like he's a like CEO of Grey Sands business, although I don't have business or CFO, like a driver, whatever, but I'm his wife. So I keep making fun of him. So he's been involved in this process, but I think he knows how important what I'm doing it doing is in my life. And, and then he, he also knows of basically what I'm doing. So for example, in Winnipeg, I was living in a townhouse where I had a basement. So sometimes I frustrated or really emotional, then he, he used to grab my shoulders. Okay, Grace, go to basement, make ongi, the large pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so he just used to send me to the basement and I, I'm stuck there for like three, four hours. And then I came up with like big smile. <laughs> <laughs> so he knows, yeah. So he's involved in many, many ways. Uh, that's wonderful. I'd love to uh, open the floor to the audience. And if you have any questions, it's there are not a lot of us. So it's a good uh, opportunity to unmic yourself and ask questions directly to, uh, to Great if you have any. Is the clay different here than it would be in Korea? Is it is there a different composition or is it clay clay? So what do you mean like clay? Clay, like the, what you work with. Is clay. It, yeah, is it the same? I know nothing about ceramics except I like to look at them, but I've never handled it. And so I, that may be a very naive question. No, it is. It's not naive because I struggled a lot when I first got into ceramics in Canada because the clay is different and how people treat the clay is also different so i had to shift my mind of course how i treat my clay so for example in korea you no know, the clay comes in a bag and then it's 10 kilogram in a bag i used to pay like three dollars then i get a bag of clay and then made whatever here i saw people measuring clay on a scale and then collecting all the sleep and slurch from his ha their hands and then recycle the clay. I couldn't understand why they're doing it. Then of course the one bag can be like 20, $25 oh. or more expensive. So yeah, just handling clay, especially when I make those large pieces, not just the clay composition, but just uh, shifting the mindset was, was challenging. And here, I think many people make their own clay so there was new process that I learned here in Canada, in Korea. It's cheap, right? So I can just get it and ship it. It's a small peninsula, but here the delivery cost is expensive. So many people make the clay. So it was a good experience that I was able to mix my own clay by adding materials and then find my favorite clay, my own recipe. That was really good. That's, I didn't know you could make your own clay. I I know. Know. Yeah, that's interesting. Marion, I see that you've unmiked yourself. Oh yeah, I'm just in awe because I love the forms. I love these organic forms. And to see little tiny you, because you are a petite gal <laughs> in there, laying that stuff up is phenomenal. I just, I'm just sort of in like, I'm still stunned here. And I have never seen a hand, a foot operated wheel before, mm -hmm. you know, I had just, I never, I, not, I know of them, but I've never seen them. Um, and I think the, the whole way in which you are putting so much of your heart and your philosophical soul into your work is really wonderful. It makes it just that much more special. So thank you so much for sharing that. And on the clay body, I want to ask, is it like a, is it more of a stone Ware versus porcelain because of the scale of the of the pieces you're making? Yes. So when I make the large pieces, I choose a stoneware that has a little bit of sand. But I when I throw like small pieces, those white More, pots, yep. those are porcelain. Mm -hmm. Right. How did you find it when you started making molds? I did oh. once and I was a disaster. It was so hard. It is hard, and then I sometimes go through the disaster at the moment. But again, like that plaster mold making is the process itself is very complicated and very time sensitive because it hardens like almost immediately. 
but again, I like those challenges. So I try to find those processes that challenges me and mold making is one of them. Oh. Send me the send me the easy path. I want the uh, molds for dummies. Sorry, that was my dog, and the other one arrived, and they're having a nightmare in the other room. Um, well, maybe I just have to try harder. I went to the gardener and did it. I I I couldn't believe. I mean, it was it was really hard. Mm -hmm. and so I got to go back at it again, don't I? You you will enjoy it once you go through all the process, and then you know. Then yeah, because so many people that I see once they get something, then they want to not just do one of a kind, but do repetitive things mm -hmm. that then can become part of the bigger whole. The mold making makes such a huge difference to their ability to produce anything. Right, my now, I don't mean yeah. quantity necessarily, yeah. but these nuts I they're made, all molded, aren't they? All molds, yeah, yeah. So I made one mold, no one piece of the nut shape. Then yeah. I made a mold of that. Then I made a mold of the mold so right. that I can copy those molds. So right. that I have like 20 some molds for the same piece. So right. I just test like multiples at the same time. And then you're using like a slip, a, mm -hmm. a, a very like a liquid. Right. It gets poured into them, right. Mm -hmm. Well, that was nice because that allowed the kids to break them. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd have a freak if someone picked up some of my pieces are so fragile. They had to go, ah. <laughs> uh, so the mold comes in handy. Right. Any other questions? Did you enjoy that? When you, when you make those very large vessels, how do you have a, a how do you fire them? Like or they just sit out and dry, or do you have to fire them? So usually the big pieces I make those pieces during my residencies. Mm -hmm. So whenever I go to residencies, first thing I do is measuring the kilns so that I can check how big I can go. Okay. Yeah. And then I just make a little bit smaller than the kiln so it can fit in. Yeah. And then I it can must get be quite it. a job to get it from your basement to the kiln. So that I always need somebody. So home studio, of course, my husband. But residencies, I always ask those technicians or any staff who's around. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the thing. That's one bad thing about going big is you, I can't be- can't do it on your own. And then, mm -hmm. I want to be just independent because I don't want to ask help too much. But yeah. Okay, Grace, residency. go small or go home. Uh, <laughs> okay. I go big and I'm not going to go home. <laughs> but you could still make those little, the stools and things behind you. Mm -hmm. Those would be navigable at you, for yourself. Those that scale. Uh, the putting into the kiln, I needed some help because yeah. it was like a top loading, so I had to right. put it down. Oh, top loading! Mm -hmm. You know, you may. Did you by any chance watch our visit to South Africa that Isabel did last week? To the okay, they had a kiln that was very interesting, and they also had a pneumatic. Uh, cart that they just rolled the whole thing over to mm -hmm. and then they just sat it on a roll in and it went into the kiln i've never seen that before do they yeah, have like, that where you are the residency that place yeah. the medicine head yeah they had the cart and they had one front loading kiln right so in that sense i can just do it by myself but right. i had so many pieces that i can't just fire one by one so i had yeah. to use many kilns at the same time yeah, yeah, so I have to use that top loading kilns. Do the do they shrink the same way small pieces do? Like the pieces I make, they go 10 or 15% smaller sometimes. Mm -hmm. So do the big pieces have that same reduction? Yes, if you're using the same clay body. So for okay. example, at, at University of Manitoba, that's where I studied, we have one big soda kiln. So I put one big piece and then I put a cone pack on top of the piece. Then yep. I was checking the temperature during the firing process. Then whenever I check, the cone pack was going lower and lower and lower because it was shrinking because I could wow. see the shrinkage happening. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Grace. I wanted to mention to you that um, we have in the six, um, 
uh, students who were awarded the same award as uh, as Grain uh, as Grace, sorry, was uh, Shu Xian. And you remember we met her a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she's in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So she was also. And these two ladies were the only two ladies out of the six uh, who won the award. And one of the uh, judges. Uh, was uh, Brendan Lee Satish Tang, who is uh, also based in Vancouver, who has an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And he's taking part in Carrie's Crafted Vancouver. And we're going to do a conversation with him and with an artist from uh, London. So the Sika pool of talent is, uh, is very rich. And we're certainly going to share more of it with you. So, um, Thank you. I hope that uh, you enjoyed that. Great.